even if you're not on the ground there, you do need some level of support that's there in person. Some people might have a dedicated handyman, some people might have a property manager or a property management team, or some people might have the situation like mine where it's investment partners, but you need some level of support on the ground. Welcome back to the Invest Her podcast. This is Liz Faircloth. And I am your co-host, Andressa Gidelli. So self-managing properties can be overwhelming and really time-consuming, but it does not have to be. Today, we're focused on self-managing hacks so you can actually invest long distance effectively. That's correct. We are interviewing Mary Ragana, and she's going to share with all of you simple hacks that you can increase your cash flow, increase your tenant satisfaction, and not have to pay the property management fee because you have an option to use a software for free to do all the self-management. Does this sound like a good thing to you? It sounds to me. Stay tuned. Mary, many investors are nowadays self-managing from a distance right? Some, for some people are like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. I cannot manage my property on the corner. Can I even imagine out of state or, or in the same state, but far from, from me? But what strategies and tools have you used to do that successfully? There's definitely a little bit of risk and there's a little bit of fear even with uh, managing something when you're not right next door to it. Um, but there are things that you can do to make it a little bit easier. I think One of the biggest pieces of advice that I can impart on people is that even if you're not on the ground there, you do need some level of support that's there in person. Now, that's going to look different for every single person. In my case, I actually have investment partners that are in person, um, local to the properties that we own, and that's worked out really well. Some people might have a dedicated handyman. Um, Some people might have a property manager or a property management team, or some people might have the situation like mine where it's investment partners, but you need some level of support on the ground. Um, I actually have a, a good example of why this is so important. So just a couple months ago, one of my business partners was doing one of her sort of semi regular drive bys of one of our properties, because that's a big part of why you need to have some level of support that's there. Um, and as she was driving by, she saw that uh, the the city trash can was out front of the building. It was full and there was trash all over the ground right in front of our property. So she got out of her car. She picked up all the trash. She put it back in the city trash can. She called the city and she said, hey, the trash isn't getting picked up. Um, so she logged an official ticket with them so that they could resolve it. So by doing that, she helped with any issue of having trash in front of the building. She was able to make sure that we got back on a regular schedule of getting garbage picked up. But in addition, we actually a couple of weeks later got a fine from the city because they said that we were leaving our trash cans out front and, and that trash was accumulating. But because she had called earlier and we had an official ticket with the city for it, we were able to get that fine wiped. Um, so again, Sometimes it's easy to assume that no news is good news when you're from afar. And that's why it's really important to make sure you've got some support on the ground. Yeah. I I just want to add to that because when we transitioned from local investing, like 30 minutes to a far far further, I think it's really important what you said from the owner side perspective. So you have a partner that has like ownership of the building because people are like, oh, I have a property manager. I have a property manager. But you have to remember how how do property managers get paid? What are they managing? They may have your best interest if they're a good property manager, but are they going to look at your property the same as an owner would? I'd say probably not. So I would always say, I love what you said. And I'd say if there's a way to get like an owner's rep, even if you don't have a business partner, we've paid real estate agents separate from a property manager to be our eyes and ears uh, because property managers are going to tell you what sometimes you want to hear, not actually what's happening two different things. Who's representing you as the owner is always going to care for and and really look out for the property in a very intimate way over a property manager that's getting paid, you know, from a vacancy or, you know, they're getting paid in different ways that may not be like, go look at the property, make sure there's not trash outside. And I think that that's and I, when you, then people start like, let's play devil's advocate here, right? Then people are saying, well, 
But, you know, paying a um, owner's wrap, that will cost more and decrease my cash flow. But let's play Mary's scenario over here. Yeah, How absolutely. much will cost, Mary, for you, possible estimate, right? Having that trash there in terms of your tenants observing what's going on there. The ticket of the city. How much was the ticket of the city? Like there's much more uh, lost or loss of potential of income not having eyes and boots on the ground versus just ha paying somebody to make sure that those things don't, ha don't happen. If we were to estimate the impact of having those things there, Mary, what would you say in terms of dollar signs? Well, so the ticket was for $200. Um, so that got wiped, right? And then on top of it, so tenants aren't always good at proactively letting you know when there's issues. We've all seen that within the units themselves. Well, not especially. always, never. <laughs> right, right, right. It's very <laughs> rare to have a tenant that's going to reach out kind, and be like, Mary. hey, there's a problem that's brewing. You should probably come here and, and proactively right. solve it. Um, and so, and, and it's even less likely when it's common areas or outside of the building. Um, but it doesn't mean that they aren't ticked off by it. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that they aren't like, you know what, I don't want to live in a property anymore that has trash everywhere. And so there's also the cost of potential, you know, actually going back to the property managers, you could try to have that conversation with them that, Hey, this could increase vacancy yes. because if we have trash everywhere and the outside of the building looks bad, people are going to move out and then other people don't want to move in. So no, the, the cost is very high. You have to really make sure that it's not just the unit themselves, but also the surrounding area that looks like a place that people want to live. You were making a good point because if it's not kind of like affecting me, if my water is not affecting me, I might just like, well, let's keep keep going with this until we... They the don't care if the faucet's dripping. They did care less, right? Well, I found out that my, one of my tenants, the toilet was, was dripping when I got the bill. And I was like, what's going on here? A thousand bucks for uh, like a, what? what's going on? And you're like, <laughs> it's like, right. I think the toilet has a problem. You are a 28 year old nurse that saves babies and mothers. And you believe that your toilet running it's not a problem. <laughs> like what's what where on earth? But anyway, let's stop bashing the 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 tenants here and let's get to the the pitfalls. So boots on the ground for for sure having having that, right? And uh when we were talking about like what strategies can investors use to maintain a higher level of tenant satisfaction besides the one that we just talked about what have you used in order to say i'm not i'm attracting new tenants always the case right but how do you maintain that your current tenants quote unquote happy this is a great question too so i in addition to our long distance um, properties that we have that are in cincinnati i actually also own a property here in chicago where i'm based um and i actually think it's harder at the property where I'm based than it is long distance. Really? Because oftentimes when I'm having conversations with people that are walking through, I have to tell them, listen, we live in the same building, but we will not be in your space. We will respect your privacy. We come into the unit only when you reach out to us and tell us that there's a problem or if we're aware that there's a problem. We're not going to like encroach on that. And so I feel like I almost have to have this extra conversation to say, again, your privacy is protected. I rented for 10 years before we ever owned any property. And I can tell you that it wasn't so much that I wanted face-to-face -face time with my landlords. It's that they want their issues resolved when they raise them and they want good communication. And you can achieve that without being next door to your tenants. Um, you can do that through making sure that you're keeping track of all of your maintenance tickets. And then again, if let's say we had an example of this, you know, not that long ago where a dishwasher actually it was a washing machine that had broken. And so we had to order a new one. So we reached back out to the tenants and we let them know we've ordered a new washing machine. It's going to be in in a week just to give them that level of communication so that they know we're resolving it. And here's the timeline for when you can expect a fix. So in my experience, that matters so much more than any of the face to face face necessarily that, that can be required sometimes for, um, for tenants. 
I, I want to just mention that I, I think so often people that are buying properties and they're managing the properties, they put so much energy into the right apps and tools to like collect rent to, uh, to screen tenants. And then if you ask them about maintenance, I'm like, how do you deal with maintenance? They're like, oh, I get a post-it note and write the, post-it note. It's like so, you it's, it's post-it so note? barbaric. Yeah, post-it note. Like it's barbaric. Like that's not effective on any level. So <laughs> what, no? I'm just as like, what, you don't even know. I don't know. I thought maybe dress. my English kicked in here you and I don't understand what is. post-it note is. It's this. <laughs> Post-it note is this, my friend. This is what a post-it note I looks like. I know what it is. I thought it's just all right, all right. really like, it's going to fall. <laughs> exactly. So my point, though, is that a lot of investors that are scaling one, three, five, seven, ten properties, you'll ask them, and they have these robust systems to screen and to collect money. And when it comes to maintenance, it's like they got back to the Stone Ages and they have no idea how to manage that properly. Yet, from a retention perspective, that, is going to be the biggest and the communication overall communication as you're saying correct correct so you just said maintenance ticket people are listening like what are you talking about a ticket first off so walk walk us through that a little bit how do you how do you manage that you know what software is obviously and and because that's important I, i can't stress it enough being a multifamily investor for 20 years that literally will save you and retain the right people so share share with us a little bit how your what what your processes look like Yeah, for sure. So we do use software um, to manage maintenance, uh, which is why, again, I referred to it as a maintenance ticket. So when a tenant has an issue, they just log a ticket directly in the system. And we get a notification direct to our phone and to our emails that lets us know that there's been an issue. Now, we manage them ourselves. You can also set it up so that you have a maintenance staff or a maintenance person that's also on communication with that if you want to make sure that they're the ones that are resolving the issue. Um, then we take a look, we see what it is. And what's really, really nice is actually we can start to communicate with the tenant right away before we've even done anything. So we had another example. This just happened last week where there was a dishwasher that went out for one of our tenants. Uh, they logged a ticket. They told us the dishwasher wasn't working. We immediately followed up with them and we said, we will send somebody out to take a look at it. But can you first try these three things? And one of them was under the sink, there's a switch that you have to have turned on in order to make sure that the dishwasher runs. And I'm sure like everybody has a property or has lived in a place where this is the case, there's a switch. And it got, you know, and we were like, just make sure that it hasn't gotten turned off. Sure enough, that was the problem. Somebody had flipped the switch accidentally. They turned it on and the dishwasher was fixed. We never sent anybody out. We never sent any money. We immediately resolved it for the tenant. So that increases their satisfaction. And again, we all did, we did it without any need for face-to-face interaction or anything. That's my love language. I think that's my love language. Like try those three things. It's like a level, let's break that down. It's like a level of like scaling, right? First, let's make sure we understand what the problem is. Let's troubleshoot first. And then if we are not able, then we send somebody there. And I also think that By doing those things, you start creating a history with that person. Because if if Susie gets her drain clogged three times in a month, we we have a a problem. (laughs) We have a recurring problem. Because I won't remember with the freaking post note who who had a problem when when did they have a problem? What is going on over here? Right? It might be a bigger problem then what that superficial problem is. So I think it's all like about data point, not customer service 100%, because you're like, oh, I love this. We resolve it. I didn't have to wait until somebody came over here to just freaking switch. And I am happy about it. I like the communication. We go along. Question for you. Do you have like a, besides those like, test those three things for the dishwasher. Do you also have like a standard operating procedure for troubleshooting anything type of deal? Um, In some cases, yes. In other cases, honestly, (laughs) maybe some landlords will understand this and others won't. A lot of times we pull up Google like anybody else would and we do a quick search to make sure that we're checking everything before we actually call in 
like a plumber or some one of our like professional people that we have on staff. Um, typically we start with that and then, um, and then we'll call somebody. And if we need to, like, if it's not going to be resolved, have an idea. Have an idea. <laughs> we should create like a SOP for troubleshooting the most common question. So Mary pass to me all the common questions and, and we're going to use AI to come up with the three things they should do Great. before we you pass it along to your maintenance and then we're going to share with all of you <laughs> that are listening right now right think about how much time you could save people <laughs> so much time and money for, like how, for for, it's so, for the landlord right it's so frustrating when something like that happens and you do go on site or you pay to have somebody go on site and it's such an easy fix like that it's almost like man, if I would have known or if I would have thought, then I could have saved that money or I could have saved that trip. So yeah, I mean, anytime you can help the tenant fix it themselves. And there's that saying, what, like teach a man to fish or you can buy them the fish. And so the more you kind of give them the tools to take care of their properties, the, the next time the tenants are going to flick that switch themselves. Here's why I, I'm being such a, a nuisance and a stickler on like, getting the maintenance tickets and having something that allows you to do this because I really wish we did this uh, for so many years and we didn't. I think we we eventually did, but I've been at this a long time. And I remember we got sued. I mean, we got sued multiple times, but um, the first time we got sued by a tenant and it was a slip and fall situation. And and I remember what they were saying wasn't accurate, what, what actually happened. And they said something about certain maintenance issues. Now, had I had my little history, and I had a place that I could have looked and said, actually, that's not accurate. I have it in writing here. Then we would have, I would have, we would have embraced. I mean, we ended up winning and, and actually overcoming the, the, the suit, but whatever that's called. Um, but that would have been really helpful rather than looking through my emails. So that's number one. The second thing from real life experiences, preventative capital, uh, improvements. So if you start to look at your property and go, listen, I've gotten called. 25 times this this year on water, then maybe there's something bigger happening and you might need to make that investment. And that's the kind of strategic decisions that people don't think about because they don't have they don't have history to look at. So I know I'm being a nuisance to keep bringing this up, but I, I really wish we did that more when we were growing our portfolios and buying our properties uh, because that would have saved us money, time, and energy. But I, I want to talk about preventative Let's talk about preventative maintenance. Because again, if you're scaling, if you're not doing preventative maintenance, it's going to hurt you in the end, hands down. If you have one property, maybe not. But if you're growing and scaling, it's going to really bite you. You know where. So walk us through, do you have like a system in place where do you do like certain walkthroughs preventatively to, to check that, you know, toilet running or that 19 people are living in the property or whatever information you want to check? Um, what do you do? We keep track of, I think mostly it's kind of age of appliances and ages of different things so that we sort of have a good sense of when things are probably going to start to kick the can a little bit um, and when we're expecting there to be potential issues. We do keep track of that. And that way, on a regular basis, we can um, keep it like we know, again, when to start checking for those sorts of things. Um, anytime we have tenant turnover, we also do a full kind of scan of the entire apartment. Um, we almost always catch things because, again, tenants aren't very good about being proactive and letting you know. There's been so many times when I've walked through and been like, the dishwasher is just one that always happens. And I've walked through apartments so many times where the dishwasher was broken. And you're like, how long was this broken for? We would have fixed this for you. Why didn't you tell us about that? Um, and so, yeah, anytime there's turnover, we always do kind of a full scan of the place and make sure that we're aware of, again, any potential issues. Um, that might arise. And we just sort of try to keep track that way um, to make sure that, again, we kind of know how the properties are faring and when we anticipate that there could be potential issues. Thinking about like self-managing, right? I think a lot of people here, oh, that's a lot of stuff and a lot of like contact with uh, the tenant. I, I do think that, of course, if you vet the tenant, if you keep your property updated if you implement the ticketing system that Liz loves it. I right? do. It's, it, sh it shouldn't be this like, oh my gosh, uh, what's going on over, over here. So with, with, let's talk about for a second about Inango, right? So it's when I, when I log in, 
is there a place that I can see, okay, this tenant here is going to be moving out and this is the list of items that I need to check and can I keep that list inside? Because I am all about data. Like how can I collect data? How can I keep data there to be useful moving forward? So if there is a turnaround and I have the checklist, am I able to kind of like plug in that inside that unit so the unit itself has a history? The answer to your first question, can you track when people are going to be moving out? Yes. And you get a notification. So in addition to logging directly into Inago, you do get an email that says, hey, you've got somebody that's moving out in the next 60 days, just a heads up so that you can reach out to the uh, tenant proactively and ask them if they want to renew or if you're going to need to find um, to find a new tenant. So you do get that. You can attach any type of documents directly within Inago. So if you have a move out checklist or a move in checklist or any other documentation that you want to keep against that unit or that tenant, you can absolutely have that. We are in the process of developing our own move out and move in checklist templates that will be available in the future as well for landlords to be able to use. Right now, again, it's really you uploading your own documents, but that is something that's coming um, hopefully soon in the future for Inago. And Mary, whenever you've presented to to our community or, or working with our, our Strive mentees, uh, they always are so intrigued and we teach them well. They're like, hold on, <laughs> it, this is free? This is free? What's the, what's the catch? What's the catch? Do I need to put my credit card in there? You need to charge me a million dollars next month? You know, we, we've trained them well. But I'm curious, right? You guys have such a robust free, free property management software. So walk us through where is it really effective A to Z? Like what can people listening that are really growing and have that portfolio that they're they're looking to manage more effectively, where can they use it? Yeah, definitely. So if you ever hear our CEO speak about um, Inago, he always talks about the vision and the goal as being the true best tenant management platform. So we, we don't get bogged down with a lot of things as far as accounting. You do have reporting. You do have certain things that are available to you as a landlord. But at the end of the day, the heart of the software is focused on that tenant management. And you'll feel that when you use the software. So one of the best things that you can get out of Inago is all of the automated communication. So like I mentioned before, not only does it remind you when somebody's moving out, but it takes care of the entire payment process for you. So it reminds your tenants when a payment is coming up due. You, they automatically, you know, they can pay directly through Inago. They can either set up auto pay or they can you know, pay each month if they want to. If they're late, it lets them know that they're late. It lets them know that there's been a late fee applied in the instances where that's gotten applied. And then it automatically enforces that late fee on your behalf. So there's a ton. And then just one other thing too on the communication. So the maintenance tickets too is a really good example. So that whole communication chain that I explained before was all through Inago. Um, so not only does it allow you to communicate back and forth with the tenant, but it also tracks it so that it's directly in that system. So Liz, going back to your point before, you've got it all stored right there. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. So what do you find to be the biggest pains and challenges that people are coming to you guys to say, listen, because there's so many property manager software is out there. I mean, there's a lot, right? I feel like when I started, there was like one, um, like back in my day, uh, 50 years ago, but <laughs> 19, yeah, exactly 1975. But no, I wasn't born at that point. <laughs> but, but, but what would you say are the biggest challenges that, you know, you know, people really need to evaluate and say, okay, what is the right software for me? Uh, I mean, I love the free part, of course, but it's got to make sense, right? From so many logistical perspectives. So I'm curious, what do you find to be, and all the people that you work with, the biggest pains, challenges, especially women who have a portfolio? It's a big undertaking, right? Having to transition over to something. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. So yeah, I think the free aspect, we get a lot of people that come to us that say, I, you know, I have a portfolio, I want to manage my properties, but everything out there right now is just very expensive. And again, the fact that we are the only free software out there for managing your rentals um, makes us a great choice, you know, if, if price is something that you're really considering. I think, again, because our focus is on that tenant management, we've put a lot of time and energy into the tenant app and the tenant desktop version of Inago to make it really easy for the tenants to go on and pay, uh, to set up those auto pays, to sign up for renter's insurance, to do whatever it is that they need to do. So we've made that be a really seamless process because at the end of the day, 
our goals are aligned to the landlord's goals because we get paid when the tenant makes a payment. So we've done everything that we can to make it as easy as possible for tenants to get those payments in because otherwise we don't see a payment either. So I think that's sort of a uniqueness that you're going to see in Inago compared to others in the market. And then we hit a lot of the same baseline requirements that you're going to see across a lot of property management software. Um, another pain point that we hear a lot is how quickly people get their money. Um, and ours is, you know, just on track with, with everyone else in, in the, um, in the industry where, you know, it's one business day to process. And then the next business day, you're going to see the, the funds come into your account. But I think in terms of what really differentiates us from the rest of the market, it's truly that fact that our goals are really aligned with yours. We're not just trying to get you in the door and get you to pay a subscription fee. And then we don't really care because you're paying once a month anyway. We truly need you to get your tenants to pay in order to get the money from the tenants as well. So we've done everything we can to make that process very easy and streamlined. And, and, you know, I think that when we hear like self-management, we are redefining how does that look like versus Uncle Tony in the past had his own tools in the basement and was doing the maintenance. So he's Uncle Tony. Oh, Uncle Tony. Uncle Tony's right. a good guy, though. I have like multiple Uncle Tonys, but go on. In the basement with all the tomato <laughs> cans over there. Tomato with uh, full Known peeled tomatoes. Anyway, so Uncle Tony was there. I think that th there is a misconception that the women in our community are not buying to that, right? They're not buying to self-managing that way because it doesn't make sense. And it's like more to their plate. That being said, we are in a time and at a day where we're looking to optimize our properties, increase cash flow. And needless to say, many property management companies, you know, if you are one of them, close your ears. You guys don't do much and you collect the money at the end of the month, right? You do when somebody just are in your face and saying, it's flooding. It's flooding. I'm telling you it's flooding, right? And you're just passing the information there. You're sending somebody to go there versus test this out and they I'm just receiving invoices right at the end of the day I have those invoices I have those things down and there is a delay I am not in touch with the customer service experience with my tenant right and for a lot of people they have a very large large portfolio and they don't want that and they don't care about that or whatever that is it doesn't fit their criteria but I think that for, for landlords that you have, a, you have a handful of properties, right? Or a couple of that. It, it, financially, I, I don't know how you will make sense to pay those prices that property management companies are putting in considering the service that they are offering. Unless property management companies really change the customer service and what they're offering to landlords, I don't see a future for it. Because what you're saying is so important. I mean, everything you say, Andres, is important, but um, what you're saying is so important because it's where, where you're going to make your money. People, you know, you have to buy right, of course, but it's in the managing. It's in the managing of that asset that you're either going to really propel and grow your, grow your asset and be efficient or not. And that then really then allows you to do more deals and grow that, grow your, your wealth. That's why it's so important what, what you just said, because it's, it's, it's in that process. And so I feel like the tools, I wish Anago was around when, when, when we were really scaling. Um, I really believe we probably wouldn't have outsourced so much. And then we had to bring it, we bring, we brought it back now. We, we manage actually everything now with a team, not because we're making more money, but because we're controlling the asset and we're controlling the narrative. That's more important. Then, it, you know, property management's sometimes a lost leader, right? I mean, it's making some money. It's not making no money, but it's not like, wow, that's why we're doing it. We're doing it to control the asset. So if you're self-managing and you're listening to this, put the, put the tools in place that you could really optimize, you know, in just a simple way, right? So I love that. Um, Mary, this is great. I, I really, so many of our, our women in our community have absolutely loved Anago and the simplicity and, and the stream and, and streamlined systems and processes. You have a great team. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for, for your, your support of our community as well. Uh, where can everyone listening learn more about 
and, and all the great resources too and learnings. I know you guys have to do a lot of education too. Yeah, definitely. So feel free to w- visit us directly at www.inago.com. And for those of you that are curious how to spell that, because I know sometimes there's some p- mispronunciations around it, it's two N's, so I-N-N-A-G-O. Um, and you can reach out. We have a uh, customer service that's available nine to five Eastern during the week. And then they do have times throughout the weekends and then into the evenings that they're available to answer any calls. Same with our sales team. Um, and then if you're interested in reaching out directly to me, you can always reach me at Mary at Inago.com. I'm happy to answer any questions, talk about my experiences, either as a landlord or talk about directly my experiences working with Inago and using Inago since I've since I started investing. So more than happy to to help or share any insights that I can. And I think that's so, so good that you, you know, because you are a landlord, right? So sometimes we're talking to people are like, you have no clue what I'm talking about, but you, you do, you have the horror stories in your back of your head. So Mary. Oh yeah. I, I have the horror stories of what it was because we've been using Inago from the start, but there were certain things that we didn't use Inago for. <laughs> and I have the horror stories of what it was like before yeah. and then after once we started using Very it. Good. So absolutely happy to share awesome. those. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for all the information that you have shared with, with our listeners and everything that you guys do for our community. Thank you. Thanks for having me.